Okay, this morning we are going to back up one verse, and we're going to look at Galatians 2, verses 14 through 21. Um, so, <clears throat> this is sort of the conclusion of an argument that Paul has been making. And I'll, I'll help us to get a running start by reviewing what Paul has been arguing and how this fits into the picture. But let me just say briefly, Paul has been arguing his divine credentials, how he received his gospel <clears throat> gosh, from the Lord Jesus Christ and not from man. And that's very important because it means that his gospel has authority. And as <clears throat> he now turns to reduce uh, Peter's position to absurdity, it's important that we understand, you know, Peter believed the same thing he did. And yet, for the sake of the Judaizers, he was abandoning it, if only momentarily. Forgive me while I take another drink. I don't know why it is. There's always some little pebble in the back there that gets me on Sunday morning. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's begin by reading the passage, Galatians 2, beginning in verse 14. But when I saw that they, and this would be Peter and those who joined him, when those from James came from Judea, and Peter began to withdraw from eating with the Gentiles, that Barnabas joined him and others as well in this hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, you see, Paul saw in that a compromise, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Well, so far that, that's pretty straightforward, that's pretty easy to understand. But now we get into the tough part, okay? But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, by the way, that last line is the punchline, isn't it? That is the main point that Paul is making here. If you take, if you believe what the Judaizers are saying, he's saying Christ died for nothing, and that cannot be. All right, well, let's, as I've said, get a running start at this. Last week, we we're looking at Paul continuing his argument for the truth of his gospel over against that of the Judaizers. Again, their position was they wanted to see Christ as an addition to the Old Covenant. Let's hold on to the Old Covenant and let's add the Messiah to it. And yes, we need to believe Jesus is the Messiah, but we still need to keep the Old Covenant rather than accepting the fact that Jesus has fulfilled that covenant and done away with that covenant and has brought in a new covenant that doesn't include those things any longer, okay? So that was their position. Now, they, because of this, believe that if Gentiles are going to be saved, they do have to become fully Jewish. They have to embrace the Old Covenant as well as Christ. Now, let me just mention something that as I was thinking, I, you know, we're, as a congregation, we're reading the book of Leviticus. I hope you've been reading that because <laughs> it's... You know, it, as you read it, you, you see what it is that Peter was talking about at the Jerusalem Council. And by the way, 
Picture Peter at the Jerusalem Council and, and what I'm about to quote from him and what he's doing in Antioch that Paul's rebuking him for because it's hypocrisy, okay? But when you read Leviticus, Leviticus, you can understand why Peter was arguing against the Judaizers at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15.10. Why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Now, I don't know. When you read the book of Leviticus, does it look to you like that's a hard thing to do? I mean, yes. I mean, but one thing that really stands out is that those sacrifices and those ceremonies show us how seriously God takes sin. But it was difficult to keep up all that activity, you know. So this should make us even more thankful that Jesus Christ has come and fulfilled everything those sacrifices and ceremonies were pointing to himself so that we may be justified simply by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that is the gospel, okay? The Judaizers want to hold on to these traditions, but Paul's not going to allow that. Now, Paul first set out to establish the divine origin of his gospel, that it came directly from Christ. And to do this, he gave four arguments. First of all, <clears throat> the circumstances surrounding his conversion. It happened on the road to Damascus when he was going there to imprison Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem for trial and execution. His life was changed. He subsequently did not return to Jerusalem, but he ministered the gospel in Syria and Arabia and did not see any of the apostles for three years. Three years after his conversion, and even after that, he just met Peter briefly, didn't compare notes, okay? So he didn't receive it from the apostles. He didn't receive it from man. He received it from Christ. Secondly, he said, the gospel transformed my life <clears throat> and the lives of those that I've been preaching to. You know, once, he says, I tried to destroy the gospel and the church was very concerned about me, but now they praise God because I am preaching the very gospel that I used to try to destroy. You see, God doesn't perform that kind of transformation through something that isn't true. He does it through the truth. So God, Paul's gospel is true. Thirdly, when he went up to Jerusalem and submitted his gospel to the apostles 14 years later, and this, I believe, was at the council in Acts 15, he found that they believed exactly as he did. You know, they didn't add anything to him. He had the same understanding, the same gospel. Again, proving that the gospel that he had received 17 years earlier from Christ was the true gospel. And finally, and this is where we're at in the argument, when Peter went to Antioch and Paul rebuked him for withdrawing from the Gentiles because of these Jews that had come, you know, from um, Judea, from James, which appeared to be Judaizers, Peter had nothing to say in his defense, showing, again, that Paul was right. But this is where we pick up the narrative this morning. Paul is continuing to argue against the Judaizers, and he does it by taking their position. Okay, that, that's what we need to understand if we're going to make sense out of this, because if you just read this text, it might almost sound like Paul is saying, while I was trying to be justified in Christ, I was exposed as a sinner. Well, it was because the law exposed his sin that it drove him to Christ. It almost sounds like he's saying that somehow the, in the gospel, he became a sinner through the gospel. That's not what he's saying. We have to understand that Paul is taking the Judaizer's position and, and taking Peter's position in order to show him, well, first of all, his hypocrisy, but secondly, that where this leads you, Peter, is to deny the work of Christ. It's to deny the very gospel that you believe and that I believe and that we know that we must believe in order to be saved. So let me just say this, that Paul's basic argument in this, in case we get lost in the details, is this, is if the Judaizers are right, if Jesus is not enough, if we also need to obey the law, well, then Jesus Christ has misled us and is actually a minister of sin, that's impossible. But even more than that, Jesus came into this world for no reason at all, and he went through all that suffering and death 
for nothing. If he did not justify us by his life and death, he came for no reason. It, it amounts to nothing. Now, again, the way that Paul argues can be hard to understand. Peter reminds us in one of his letters, and I'll tell you, as we've been going through Romans and we go through the letters of Paul, I agree with Peter, okay? There are some things he says that are hard to understand. Not, you know, what he, the, the concepts are not hard, it's just the way he puts it together. So we're going to go through this just a verse at a time and try to unravel it and see what, what's going on. Okay, now the first thing we see in verse 14 is that Paul is rebuking Peter for hypocrisy. Okay, he's being hypocritical. So let me read verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter, in the presence of all, okay, public sin, public rebuke, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles, which you were before these Jews came, and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, I hope you see that's hypocritical. If you're going to live like a Gentile, being a Jew, why are you going to tell these Gentiles they need to live like Jews? Now, Peter had accepted the fact that Gentiles uh, could become believers, could be accepted by God, Without their first becoming Jews, he accepted them as brethren. He was even living like the Gentiles. He had set aside their traditions, and one of the ways he showed that was the fact he was eating with the Gentiles. So why now does he insist that the Gentiles begin to live like Jews? Well, the reason is obvious, and I didn't read that verse, but it's from what we saw last week in verse 12, because he was afraid of what these men who had been sent by, from James, who still thought the Jews should not eat with the Gentiles until they were converted to Judaism. He was afraid of what they thought. Now, this, this can be, be a bit confusing if, if you think about this for a minute, because first of all, these men, who, I mean, from whom were they sent? Uh, from, from whom were they sent? Okay, James. James sent them. James, okay, well, he's the head of the Jerusalem Council. And this appears to have taken place after the Jerusalem Council, where the matter was presumably put to rest once and for all. So how do we make sense out of this? Well, apparently, not everyone accepted the decision of the council. We know that Paul is writing to the Galatians post-council. And the Judaizers are still at it. Okay, there were Jews that just could not let go of the Old Covenant, and they were still at it. Okay, that's not surprising. But we also do need to know that though James sent these men, he may not have been aware of what it is that they were teaching, their position. Things were still being hammered out. You know, things were still in flux, but um, at least in the minds of some. But the issue had been settled. But again, the point is this. Peter believed in justification by grace through faith alone, and he was practicing that. But after these men came, he began to behave as though he did not believe that. Now, can you, can you relate to Peter? I mean, at any point in your life, can you relate to what Peter is going through right here? This is something that we need to watch out for in ourselves, don't we? Because it's easy to say one thing, believe one thing, practice one thing when you're around a group of people that are going to enforce and agree with you. You know, they're going to enforce that behavior. But it's hard to do it when you're around people that don't agree with you. Okay? It's easy to change. Now, the point is God does not want us to become chameleons, you know, to blend in to our environment and to the society that we, are, you know, we happen to be in at the particular time. God wants us to stand out. He wants us to stand up for His truth, even if it means we are going to be pegged, you know, and we may have to suffer a bit. Yeah, you know, it, it, it can mean suffering, but I'll tell you what, the people who in a group might make fun of you and ridicule you individually will respect you if you stand firm and show courage in what you believe. Well, Peter needed to do that. He didn't. We need to make sure we don't fall into that same snare. Peter caved under the pressure. He didn't want to face these men. Now, secondly, Paul reminds Peter what they both believe, you know, what they both held to be true. 
in verses 15 and 16 that there's only one way of salvation, notice, for both Jews and Gentiles. Now, here, uh, Paul gives us a clue as to what he's going to be talking about in the following verses in what he calls Jews and what he calls Gentiles. And I just want you to notice he calls Gentiles sinners. And I think he's using this term consistently through this text, and that'll help us understand what, he's, what he means. Now, he says this, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Does that mean Paul thought the Jews weren't sinners? No, but he's using sinners in a different sense here, okay? Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we, Jews, have believed in Christ Jesus so that we, Jews, may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Now again, that's Paul's point, isn't it? Over and over again in Romans, in Galatians, in all of his letters, it's the theme of the letter to the Galatians. We cannot be accepted by God through our works but only through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And again, let me just remind you, grace and works are mutually exclusive like light and darkness, right? You, one's the opposite of the other. Grace is a gift. Works is something you earn. You cannot earn it and get it as a gift at the same time, but God gives it as a free gift. And that is what Paul's emphasis is over and over again if you add anything to it that you believe you have to earn it in some way, it is no longer a gift. Okay, well, that's the point of that particular passage. Cannot get it through our own efforts. So let's unravel this. He says, we are Jews by nature. We're God's covenant people. We are holy, okay? And not sinners from among the Gentiles. And again, he's not saying they're sinners and we're not sinners. But I think what he means by this is, yes, they are sinners. But more than that, we're not those who are far off. We're not those without God. We're not those without hope in this world, okay? We were nearer to God. They were further away from God. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, knowing that that is never how anyone has been saved, but through faith in Jesus Christ, that is by God's free grace, His gift alone, received by faith alone, even we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Peter, you and I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be declared righteous by His righteousness and not by our own, earned by our works. And then he nails it down, since by the works of the law... No flesh will be justified, since we know it's impossible for anyone to be justified in that way. Now, again, what Paul is doing, he's appealing to what Peter knows very well. He's appealing to the gospel that Peter received from Christ. Remember, they compared notes with Peter, and they, they were agreed. This is the gospel, Peter, that you preached on the day of Pentecost, Remember? The one you proclaimed before the Sanhedrin when you were arrested? The one that was agreed on by the Jerusalem council? Okay, you know these things are true. At least you did until these men showed up from James. Now, here's where we need to pay close attention because Paul is going to adopt the Judaizers' position. He argues that if the Judaizers are right, which is what Peter is saying, not with his words, but through his actions, uh, then, he, then Peter, as well as the Judaizers, are actually accusing Christ of being a minister of sin. Okay, so what does he mean by that? Well, again, Paul adopts their position in order to argue it to its logical conclusion to show that it cannot be. Okay, have you ever heard of the expression reductio ad absurdum, you know, that's one of the logical fallacies. It's something used in, in lawyer terminology. It means you take your opponent's argument, you argue it to its logical conclusion, and you show how absurd it is. Well, that's what 
Paul is doing here. So he says in verse 17, but if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, you know, you and I, Peter, we ourselves have also been found sinners, okay, not just guilty, but Gentiles, okay, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. So what does that mean? So he's saying this, if we trust in Jesus Christ alone, as we both believe is the gospel and what Jesus delivered to us, what Jesus taught us, he did say, after all, in John 3, 16, a passage that we all have memorized, whoever believes in him, now that's Jesus speaking, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's no works involved in that, okay? Jesus taught justification by grace through faith alone. So if we trust in Jesus Christ alone, in the way that he taught us to trust in him, and after trusting in him, we have been found sinners. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, we've been found out to be sinners by trusting in Christ? Well, what he means by this, and, and again, think about this, not that the Father is accusing us of being sinners for trusting in Jesus, not that Jesus is accusing us of being sinners for trusting in him, but we are found sinners by the Judaizers, okay? If, by, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we have also been found sinners or declared by the Judaizers to be no better than the Gentiles, no better than the sinners, these sinners, because we have also set aside the law, you know, circumcision and the law. That's what the gospel they believe in, what they're teaching, what they're teaching the Gentiles, and yet what the Judaizers are fighting against. If you say that by trusting in Jesus Christ, we're now no better than the Gentiles, I mean, we're, and we're doing what Jesus told us to do, aren't you saying that Jesus has become a minister of sin? Because his gospel is what is making us sinners. Because he's the one who's telling us to set circumcision and the law aside and to trust in him only. Okay? Paul says, may it never be. And I think you know that that is the strongest possible way that Paul could deny anything. Jesus would never lead us into sin. That is an impossibility. Okay, now, again, like I said, it gets a little bit complicated because there's so many pieces to it. Now, he drives the argument home in verse 18. And again, this sounds very cryptic. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed. Now, think of this in these terms. Another way of rebuilding would be restoring what I have destroyed or what I have done away with or set aside. What he means by this, if I turn again to the Mosaic traditions to be justified, I prove myself to be a transgressor or I prove myself really to be guilty of what the Judaizers are accusing me of, of being no better than the Gentiles. If I turn again to the laws that Judaizers say, then I'm agreeing with them and I am saying that Jesus isn't enough, that I am sinning by leaving the Mosaic traditions. And I am again implying that Jesus is the one who led me in this direction and he really is a minister of sin. Okay, so the whole point of this argumentation is, Peter, what you are saying is that Jesus is a minister of sin. If you're saying that what he told us is wrong and what the Judaizers say is right, because this is the way Jesus led us. This is the gospel he gave to us. But Jesus cannot be a minister of sin. Okay, so he's taken Peter's position, the Judaizers' position, to its logical conclusion. And now that he's done that, now that he's reduced it to an impossibility, he completes his argument by reminding Peter of the reason why God gave the law, and by this he means the entire Old Covenant. And, and by the way, Peter, excuse me, Paul is going to develop that through the book of Galatians. Uh, what was the purpose of the law in the first place? To show that it was never meant to save us 
but it was meant to drive us to Christ. If God did not give us the law to justify us, why did he give it? Well, he kind of hints at it here. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And what he means by this is through the law, through the law's ability to kill me, to expose my sin and to show me that I'm really not righteous. I haven't really earned anything but damnation through my obedience to the law, through its ability to kill me and to show me that I'm a sinner and without hope. I died to the law, okay? I died to the law as the way of justification. I turn from that law to Christ to be justified by trusting in Him. And when I trusted in Him, I died. I was crucified with Him so that I'm no longer under the law to be justified or condemned. So the law convicted me, it killed me, and I died to the law. I realized that is not the way I'm going to be right with God. I turned to Christ. So he says, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Having died with him by faith, I was raised with him to life, and now by the power of his resurrecting spirit, I live for God and his glory alone. Now, Paul fills this out further in verse 20 when he says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Again, he's saying, through the law, I died to the law. I died with Christ. That I'm, When I came to him to be justified, but not only to the law to be justified, but he says, I also died to myself. My old man's dead. I am dead. Remember how Jesus says, if anyone's going to come after me, you need to pick up your cross and follow me? What he was saying is, you need to die if you're going to live. And that's what Paul is reflecting here. My old man um, is dead. He's been put to death. And my old way of living, my, my old aspirations, my desires I had while I was an unbeliever, that, that's all dead now. And now I'm a new creation in Christ, and I live, only, I live only for him. He lives in me by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit has taken up his residence in me. Now I'm a temple of the living God. And he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now again, I no longer live according to those old desires, according to the old man, but I live according to Christ. I trust him, what he tells me to do. I follow where he leads. And then he gives the motivation at the end of that. He says, who loved me and gave himself up for me. He says, I do these things. I live for Christ. I've died to my old way of living. I'm living now for him because he loved me. He loved me with an everlasting love. He came into this world and he laid down his life for me. He rescued me. And that was the only way I could ever be saved. By the way, what Paul is saying here is true of us if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We owe the Lord a debt that we could never possibly repay. The only thing we can do, and the only thing He really calls us to do, is to love Him in return. And that's, that's really what the whole Bible is about, to love Him with our whole lives in the way He calls us to love Him. Now, finally, Paul makes this last statement. He says, Having been, you know, made a new creature in this way, having died to the law, having been raised, he says, to turn back now to the law, to our works, to our obedience, to earn our own righteousness, to earn our justification, is not only to reject God's grace, his free gift of righteousness in Christ, but it is also to say that Jesus Christ died for nothing. For no reason at all. He says in verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God. That is, I don't invalidate it. I don't set it aside in what I believe, in what I'm preaching in my gospel. I glory in it, the grace of God. Okay? I'm not like the Judaizers who, by adding works, 
are destroying the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. That is for no reason. Now what Paul is arguing is this. If, if we could gain the righteousness that we need, and he's going to argue this again, through the law, by our obedience to the law, God would not have had to send his son into the world to obey for us and to die for us. Uh, all that Jesus Christ had done would be meaningless and for no reason at all. That he came and laid down his life tells us that there is no other way. Okay, there is no other way. Remember how Jesus prayed in the garden? on the night of his crucifixion. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. And what he meant is the cup of suffering. If you can bring salvation some other way than my going to the cross and going through your wrath on the cross, then do it that way. But if not, then your will be done. And of course, the cup could not pass. He had to drink it because there was no other way. If we are to be saved, Jesus had to die. That's, that's Peter, uh, Paul's point. But Peter's position, the Judaizers' position, is denying that. Works have no place in our salvation from God. Uh, salvation is a broad term. I want to make sure I'm not misunderstood here. Salvation and justification are not the same thing. Justification is our acceptance with God. Salvation is the whole package, including sanctification. So I don't want to say works have no place in salvation, because they do. They are the fruit of justification. But they have no place in our acceptance with God. We are accepted because of what Jesus Christ has done and what He has done alone. So we should think about that. Next time we're tempted to think that there is something we have to do. We have to reach a certain level, a certain standard before God will accept us. We have to earn our way to heaven. Or maybe something we have to add, more prayers or more good works or whatever it might be to what Christ has done, to be accepted by Him. Anything we add, Paul is saying, I mean, this, this, think about how far Paul's going here. He's saying if you add anything to what Jesus has done, it takes away not only from God's glory, but it destroys what Jesus Christ has done. You know, there, there are those who have difficulty with any gospel that would say, you know, that, that's, that, we have, that they formulate it in such a way that our works are included. And there are those who do that. Um, sadly, the majority of the church does it. And we know some religions are actually based upon that, that claim to be Christians. But Paul is saying, you add, even something as small as circumcision, he's going to say. If you add it to the work of Christ, you destroy what he has done. You have fallen from grace, and basically Christ has died for nothing. So let's just be reminded this morning that we need to remove all of our works from that equation and not rely upon them at all. We must receive his gift as a gift, as a free gift, no strings attached. And then as Paul, determined to live by faith, okay? That's where the works come in. We love the one who loved us, and by faith we follow him all the way to the end of where he's leading us, and where he is leading us is to heaven. And the path, of course, that he leads us on is the only path that leads there. It's the one that he describes for us in his word. Well, if that didn't make it any clearer, and I'm sure that it's still a bit confusing, uh, we can maybe talk about it after the service. But for now, let's bow in just a moment of prayer. And let's again thank the Lord that it is all of him, because if it depended at all upon us, we would be lost.